Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, <coughs> I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. First Corinthians chapter 1 <clears throat> and verse number 17. The Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Father, bless your holy word now as it goes forth. Anoint the word and anoint the messenger. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul had a lot of things to say to the church at Corinth, some good, some bad. The church at Corinth had good and it had bad. I suppose in that day it's probably a typical church, maybe a little more on the fleshly side than most of them. But the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 that Christ sent me not to baptize. The letter to the church at Corinth written somewhere around 60 A.D., 62 A.D., somewhere later in the ministry of the Apostle, and by the time he got to this point in his ministry, he had just about abandoned baptism because he has said in Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 5, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. If there's only one baptism, it's certainly not water, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Greek. So that, that's obviously the one baptism that the Apostle Paul was referring to. So what that means for you today is that you're not saved because of the water that you go into. You're not saved because of anything that can touch you. You are saved by the preaching of the cross of Christ, the power that is in that cross. 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem, more than likely on the northern gate on the road to Damascus, there on a hill called Golgotha, there 2,000 years ago, a man was nailed to a cross. He was nailed to that cross and for six hours, from nine o'clock in the morning until three in the afternoon, he hung there suspended between heaven and earth. He spoke seven times from that cross. Each time is loaded with meaning to those standing around watching what happened to this man. This was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a Jewish Messiah. He was a sinless, perfect man that lived 2,000 years ago. Tacitus, Pliny, Josephus, other secular writers make record, make mention of this man that he certainly did live. Archaeologists a few years ago in Jerusalem, in that area, found, oh, lo and behold of all things, the heel, a man's heel, and driven through that heel was a spike where he had been nailed on a cross. This was physical proof 2,000 years later of a crucifixion. Was it the crucifixion? Was it the Lord's? No, 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 no. The Lord's body arose from the dead. Amen. Amen. None of his body was left in this world, including his bones. But what it did was to give, what, give archaeological, historical uh, help and proof to the fact that crucifixions did take place. It's hard for us in America today, 2019, to imagine the horrendous thing that a crucifixion was. It first of all was a public spectacle. The whole idea of crucifixion was to, to use shock on the people. It was to shock them, to let them know unequivocally that this is what happens to anyone that crosses Rome. Rome mastered crucifixion. They became very good at it. And they used it as a terrorist tactic on all of the provinces and all the people that Rome ruled over. And so here in Judea, here in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the religious leaders of that day delivered up the Lord Jesus Christ to Pontius Pilate to be crucified. They screamed, let him be crucified. Let his blood be upon us. And my dear friend, it has been. But they nailed him to a tree. You say, well now preacher, what does all that mean? Well, in the mind of God, before he ever made the first man, the Lord Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that means that before the first man was ever made, the Lord Jesus Christ was already settled to die on a cross and there give his life so that we could be saved. There's a theology attached to the cross. 
There's a theology that's attached to it that you cannot separate from the cross of Christ or from the Lord Jesus or from the preaching of the Bible. That theology is that when man sinned back there in the garden, he did not take God off guard. He did not surprise God because he did what he did. Nothing has ever happened that caused God to react to anything. He knows all of his works from the foundation. You can't imagine this morning God. You can't imagine him. You can't compare yourself to him. But he is almighty God and he knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all there is to know that can possibly be known. And he knew that when he made man, he had a special place for man that he did not have for angels, that he did not have for cherubim, that he did not have for seraphim. Seraphim. He loved man. He, he made man and gave him a privilege. He, he exalted this creature that he created from the dust of the ground and gave that man the possibility that he could become far more than any angel has ever or ever will be. And so therefore, before he ever sinned the first time, God Almighty accepted the responsibility of righting the wrong. Let that settle in. Before the first sin was ever committed by man, God Almighty had already established what he would show to his creation in his love and his righteousness and his goodness and his mercy. He would reveal himself to mankind in a way my dear friend, if you can't see that, you can't see anything. You can walk out and see the Creator. You can see the creation. You can know there's a God because you're in here breathing this morning. There's no question about that. A man is a fool that thinks all of this just happened of itself. God made everything there is. But in order to know God the way He wants you to know Him, you've got to know Him through the cross. <coughs> yes, sir. It is through that cross that God wants you to find out something about His nature, about His being, about who He is and what He is about. And to learn Him, as the Apostle Paul said, I know I'm saved and I know He called me to the road to Damascus and I know my sins are forgiven, but Paul says I want to know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. The Apostle says I want to know more about Him. In the Old Testament, the Bible says that the children of Israel saw the acts of God. They saw His miracles. They saw what He did. They observed that like anybody can observe it. But the Bible says that Moses saw His way. God revealed to Moses things about the very nature of God that it was a hard press for a man to know. The God that I preached to you this morning is not one that takes men and just casts them into hell for no reason. When He made hell, He had a reason for it. When He gives man the opportunity of residing in heaven with Him throughout eternity, He's offering to you the greatest thing that a human being could possibly ever want. Not to live forever in that piece of flesh that you're in now. Not to live throughout eternity cursed as we are in this body of death. But what God offers to us is something far, far, far greater than what you could ever know as a human being. The Bible said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Here at the cross at Calvary is the place of a message. The cross at Calvary is the place where God reaches down to man and he touches him in a way that he can't anywhere else. At the cross at Calvary, it's God's message to man and he's speaking. He's saying something. And oh, my dear friend today, would we not want to get that message? Would we not want to hear that that Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. All the Roman soldiers stood there. The Pharisees stood there. The mob stood there. The disciples stood there. But how many of them really understood what was happening at that cross? It was later when God saved the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, a persecutor, a murderer, and all that he was, everything that he was. It was on that road to Damascus when God saved him that he called that one man out of all these people that had knew, had known the Lord Jesus, that one man out of all of mankind, and he began to tell him what the cross was all about. And that's what I'm going to preach to you this morning. It is the message the Apostle Paul preached 
about the cross. How He broke it down. How He applied it. How He looked at it and looked back into eternity past. How that that cross represents something about God that you can't know any other way. How that you want to know that. You would know that. Every one of you in this house today, deep down inside your soul, you're seeking something. You're looking for something. You want to know something. And you'll never know it till you know God. And you'll never know God till you know Christ. And you'll never know Christ till you understand the cross. And there at the cross, God meets man. Amen. There's something you cannot divorce from the cross, and that's the blood of Christ. For it was on that cross that He shed His blood. The blood, when it shows up in the Bible throughout all the Scripture, speaks. It says in the book of Hebrews, the voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground. And he's talking about the voice of Adam, uh, of, of uh, his brother, of Cain's brother, uh, Abel. When he cries from the ground, he had been murdered. The blood throughout the scripture has a link from Genesis to Revelation. And there's a covenant attached to the blood. So my friend, if the shedding of blood has a covenant attached to it, that means that at the cross at Calvary, when the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood there's a covenant at that cross that dear friend is the greatest covenant bar none of all that preceded it and all that will follow it there is no greater covenant than the covenant of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that blood was shed at the cross at Calvary and the Apostle Paul was the one that God took out and he taught him what the cross meant and then he taught him what it meant he taught him how to preach it to us and this is what Paul said to the church at Corinth I come into your midst no nothing I say nothing but Christ and him crucified amen and so when he came into the midst of these people he could have talked about Jewish history he could have talked about polity he could have talked about eschatology he could have talked about all these things he said there's one thing I want to you to understand if I don't get this right none of the rest of it matters Christ and him crucified amen so the apostle said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Notice the clear delineation between the two. Baptism and the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words of man, Sophia, you know, all of that. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So the cross is the message and the burden of the apostle Paul. And no doubt the reason it was is because he knew so much about it. Though he was not standing there that day when the Lord Jesus was crucified, he was the one that God took to school and he taught him everything that he needed to know about it. And that's what we preach. The apostle says we preach Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. The natural man says, How in the world can a dead Jew that died on a cross 2,000 years ago, do anything for me? Well, my dear friend, I'll answer that question very simply. If that dead Jew that died on that cross 2,000 years ago is still dead, he can't do anything for you. That's the heart and soul of our faith. Amen! There's no compromising that point. If he's still dead, and if Christ be not risen, the apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he said, if Christ be not risen, then you're still in your sins. You're dead in your sins and your loved ones are gone. The next time you carry a casket out to the graveyard, just remember this, if Christ be not risen, if the Lord Jesus Christ is not at the right hand of the Father, glory to God, if he's not alive right now, then get a good long look at that casket and open it up and get a long look at that face of that body inside that casket and do all your praying that you can do for you're looking at him for the last time you'll ever see him you're separated and you're separated forever and there is no hope there is no future there is no life there is no reason for being here if Christ be not risen from the dead it's all one big joke and the joke is on us. Amen. But now Paul said, Is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept? Amen. Now that first fruits is, is, gets off into a beautiful doctrine. And I'm not going to preach about Christ being the first fruits. I'm going to say this. 
He's the first one to rise from the dead. Never, ever, ever to die again. That's what that means. For Lazarus died the second time. The widow of Nain's son died the second time. All that were raised died again. But when Christ arose from the dead, the shackles of death fell off of him. The chains of death fell away from him. The grave opened. That place of the dead could hold him no longer. Glory to God. He came out of the dead. He came forth from the dead, never to die again. Then he said to his disciples, because I live, ye shall live also. So the preaching of the cross is the preaching where Christ died. And it was there he made a spectacle. And the Bible said we stood there and we beheld him. The apostles said we looked at him. We touched him. We felt him. We understood him as far as we could understand him. But when the apostle Peter got up on the day of Pentecost. And he preached the cross to the Jews that day. He preached to them how they needed to repent. For what they'd done to the Lord of glory. How that they'd crucified the Lord of glory. And that was Peter's message about the cross. Until he got a hold of the preaching of the apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul made a theological argument out of the cross. He made it much higher than simply a man dying on a tree. It became something that really stirs and moves the soul. Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 6. Now, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Let me tell you something about that cross. I identify myself with the cross. Amen. Amen. Every time Satan begins to beat me down, and boy, does he ever try to beat me down, I take him to the cross. Say, stand there with me a while, devil. Let's get a good look. Look up there at that one dying on the tree. Oh, he wants to go. Oh, that's no place for the devil. Why, preacher? Because it was there that he was defeated. It was at the cross that his tomb was sealed. There on the Lord Jesus Christ dying in front of the demons. Dying in front of Satan. Dying in front of the angels. Dying in front of the cherubim and the seraphim. Some of them thought we've got him. We're done with him. We're finished with this man. Till three days later. He arose. He arose. He arose. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 12 says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. I'm going to make a statement here this morning. And I hope you can bear with me. I hope you can bear with me. You can take the Ten Commandments. You can take baptism. You can take circumcision. You can take anything that represents holiness. And when you hold it up next to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will pale in significance. He is greater than the law. He is greater than baptism. He is greater than the angels. He is greater than creation because He's the Lord God Almighty. Nothing can take away from that sacrifice. In other words, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, His death is absolutely and completely, completely, big word, efficacious. In other words, it will fulfill every need, every desire, every part that makes you who you are. You ever been to the cross? Been there. Been there. The cross is the sinner's hell in review. Yeah, it is. We live in a country where some people think that the world is just one big playpen. And that they can go out anywhere they please and do anything they please. They're called hedonist. That's a big word that simply means they live for pleasure. The satisfaction of pleasure. We live in a country like that, full of hedonist. The goal of life is to enjoy as much as you can. Satanists say, do what thou wilt. That's what the Satanists are preaching to people. 
But the Bible said in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary, he displayed to you what God thinks about sin. I want you to understand, we have our idea of sin. We have a problem with justifying our own sin. We have a problem and we're awful good. We, some folks are real good seeing the sin in others, but they can't see it in themselves. We, I don't kind of want to call what you call it, tunnel sin vision or whatever. But we have that problem. We got a problem with sin. But I hear is the greatest problem of our sin. Listen to me. The greatest problem with our sin is simply this. It is coming forth from a creature that was never holy to begin with. Never holy to begin with. We've always known that. Born under the curse. But the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary. Pure. Holy. Undefiled. That meant that when that sin came into his body. When he was made sin for us who knew no sin. It had to be such a horrendous shock. When he took that within himself. That it had to have driven him to the point of insanity. How in the world is he going to bear the sins of the world? Yet God is showing the world that the sinless, perfect Son of God is the only one that can bear the sins of all mankind. Amen. Just yesterday, a man kills his family and goes in to a into a trailer and he murders his mother and he murders his father day before that guy walks in to a bank and he tells these five women to get down on the floor they get down on the floor face down he walks up to them one by one and puts a gun to their head and blows their brains out and murders five women they're crazy the country is going screaming mad why? Because the floodgates have been opened and men play with sin and they make a mock at sin. And that's what's happening with us. We ought to have a hatred. We ought to have a holy hatred. We ought to have a holy, righteous hatred for sin and for what it's all about. For it separates us from God. It ruins our fellowship with the Lord. It robs us of our joy. Steals our fellowship one with another. And it takes the power of God out of our lives. And that's for sinful creatures like us. Can you imagine when the Bible said God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied? In plain words, he saw how he wrestled with becoming that. That was the cup, dear friend. He began to drink that he prayed about at Gethsemane. And he didn't finish drinking that cup until he had completely become sin for us. Who knew no sin? My, 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 my. Are you a fornicator? Are you a liar? Are you a thief? Are you a prostitute? Homosexual? Are you, uh, do, you, do you traffic with human beings? What is your sin? Are you into pornography? Are you deep into it? Is it gutting your very life and robbing your soul? Well, let me tell you something. Don't take it to you church don't take it to people don't take it to somebody to pray for you about take it to the cross take it to the cross and there bow down before the Lord Jesus and say Lord Jesus you are the manifestation of God's love to me and there's no way in the world that I could even understand what all this means but I know you died for me forgive me and you'll get power through the cross. You see, the Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us who are saved, it is what? Power. The power of God. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number, Ephesians 2.16. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, thereby... Both who? All of mankind. All of the divisions of mankind. All of the races. All of the statues. All the stages of life. Everything. That he might bring them together in Christ. They all become equal. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ are not accepted. I'm accepting Americans and I'm accepting Italians and I'm accepting Africans. No, 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 no. I'm accepting sinners. Sinners. In the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, to reconcile both into God in one body by the cross. Boy, boy, if God allowed it to happen, he's got to make it right. How many agree with that? Because if he does not make it right, then he's culpable. Well, man has a free will and man has a responsibility. Yes, he does. And in the book of John, chapter number one, it says of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the light. The light of every man that cometh into the world. Did you know there's a hell? How many believe that? I quit preaching it, but I believe in hell, friend. I believe murderers go to hell. I believe they go to hell. Somebody needs to get to this one that just murdered his family and say, you're going to hell. Oh, I'm a Christian. I go to church. No, you're going to hell. Murderers go to hell. The only thing that can change you from being a murderer is the blood at that cross, that covenant. Ask you a question. Have you repented? Oh, preacher, I believed, but I haven't repented. Then you didn't believe. Have you repented? What do you mean, have I repented? Have you gotten so tied up, worked up, so stressed out with what you are when the Holy Ghost comes in and begins to open you up like a can of worms and show you the depths of your soul and your heart, how depraved you really are, how lost you are from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. And you come crawling to God and you say to the Lord, Oh God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on my soul. Save me. And when you do that, he saves you and you get up from there and you feel clean all over. But you start into something that you didn't know anything about beforehand. You get into some real heavy duty repenting. Well, I haven't repented. Then you haven't believed. You haven't believed. You see, the cross is there to show you what you're made out of. The Bible says he made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 2.14 Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross. <coughs> Think about what I just read. Did you hear any of the rest of those apostles say anything like that? In 1945 Landsberg Prison you can pull up the YouTube. The video was taken. The officer would stand there. The officer would be standing there like this. He'd be reading the death warrant of that person that's about to be hanged. He'd read his death warrant. Read it. There's the officer. The troops would take him and they'd take him up to the top of the scaffold and they'd put a rope around his neck and the chaplain of Minister or somebody be standing up there with him, pray with him, and then they would drop the drop the, the floor out from under him, or however they did it, and he would hang till dead. What hung him, preacher? This. These are his war crimes. This is what he's guilty of. The officer reads them off. Guilty of this, guilty of that, guilty of this, guilty of that. And then he hangs. The officer took it up. And he held it up there for me. And he read them off. He did this, he did that, he's this, he's that. He deserves to hang. All I can say is, you're right. I deserve it. If anybody ever deserved to go to hell, I do. Bind him. Take him to the scaffold. Hang him.
hang him till he's dead. As they begin to lead me away, one stronger than all the rest of them. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. You didn't read it all. Look at the fine print down there at the bottom. His crimes have been paid for. The prosecutor says, well, I hate to do this, but let him go. Thanks be unto God that all my crimes are recorded, all my sins are listed, and then right there at the bottom, paid for. That's what the cross was for. Paid for. They've been paid. Somebody's already hung for them. Somebody's already suffered for them. Somebody's already paid the debt for them. The Lord Jesus paid the debt for them. They can't be charged again. It's already clean. It's already paid for. He saved me from myself. Do you understand that the Apostle Paul is telling you one of the great doctrines of the New Testament is the vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ where He suffered in your place. That's what that means. That's a Latin word. It means in your place. The vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ in your place. Now, there's not a one of you in here today if you've lived long enough to breathe that would want a list up here on this stage read off of all the places you've been and all the stuff you've done. You wouldn't want it. If this was put up here, you know what happened? You'd crawl out that back door or get out, the, get out of here as fast as you could. And they'd never see your face again. Never. You'd be so embarrassed, so ashamed. So ashamed. I mean, you'd be ashamed to death to come back in the midst of people. Aren't you glad that in the sight of God... That every one of us, if you've been to Calvary, every one of us, our slate is clean. Look around you. If they've been born again, their sins are gone. They're forgiven. That's what the cross is about. You mean it all gets done at the cross? You better believe it. It doesn't get done in a confessional booth. It doesn't get done in a baptismal pool. It doesn't get done with some kind of a some kind of ordinary or some kind of a religious ceremony. It gets done if you can make it to the cross. Your sins will be forgiven. Would you do that this morning? The cross. Here's what Jesus said about it. Our Lord Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's a big deal right there, the author and finisher of our faith. He designed it and brought it to fruition. Amen. He designed the way you would come to God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Amen. What do I have to do, preacher? You don't do anything. What you have to do is to receive what He's done for you. Amen. You can't add anything to it. If you simply be willing to say, Lord Jesus, all the charges are right, it's fair, I'm guilty. And I say to you today, he paid the sin debt. Would you be willing to accept that? If you'd be willing to accept that, then you can accept him as your Savior because that's what he's doing, saving you. Forgiving you of your sins. Father, in thy holy name, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray. Your word now is not going to return void. Maybe we can help some soul in this house today. Somebody's watching this thing. Somebody watch it later. Somebody will hear it. I pray. Bless your holy word. In Jesus' name. Amen.